Hey everyone, Eric here. In this video, I'm going to show you how to build a SaaS financial model for an enterprise software company that's scaling from pre-revenue to a $1 billion valuation in four years. I'll show you how to build the P&L, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement, model out the assets, the depreciation, the fundraising rounds, all to try to hit that $1 billion valuation by month 48. It's going to be a lot of fun, so let's jump straight in. Okay, so with any startup financial model, the first place you need to begin thinking is what does the customer acquisition model look like? So in the case of an enterprise software business, generally you have these large sales teams because with a low price product like let's say you're buying something for $20 or $50, you can usually just run Facebook ads and do SEO and you can get people to buy. But when the ticket on a product is 10, 20, 30, $100,000, you're actually gonna to need to develop a sales team to start relationships with people because it's hard to convert people like that. So generally it's, it's less relying on like these paid, paid ads and more on these large enterprise software sales teams. So let's build out that sales team and figure out, um, you know, what do we need to do to get to that $1 billion valuation? So first off, I'm blocking off month one through 12 in my model. I'm just gonna hide this. And in these months, we're gonna build this a little bit later, but we're gonna be investing in the platform and developing our product. So we're gonna not gonna generate any revenue in those first 12 months. And we're gonna go live in month 13, and we're trying to figure out how much revenue do we need to get in these first three years to hit that billion dollar valuation. So let's start. So sales funnel. Generally lead generation is you know where every business starts so let's start with advertising spend and um, I'll show you kind of how to build this funnel so let's say we start with like 25,000 a month right and with this advertising spend we're trying to get leads and a lead is basically someone who has given us some piece of information and given us an indication that they're interested in our product so maybe we advertise to them on LinkedIn or whatever it is, and they sent us their email, they subscribed to something, they said they scheduled an appointment with us to say, hey, I wanna learn more about this. So leads. So in our case, let's say a lead, um, we end up paying $500 in marketing for each lead. So it's, it's hard to get these people. We're searching around a lot, but ultimately what that gets us is a number of leads. So let's say equals round, the round formula just takes the decimals off and because we're dealing with like humans, we can't have decimal points. So we'll say 25,000 divided by 500 a lead, comma, zero is rounding to a whole number. Okay, so from those $25,000, we get 50 leads. Now, let's try to figure out, okay, how many leads can one like sales agent handle in one month? So you know, we're handing them over a certain amount of leads and we say, okay, go after these people. They've said that they're interested in our company. Um, so let's say in this case, it's 25. And again, you know, each company will be completely, completely different with these numbers. Maybe the cost per lead will be much lower or the one sales agent can handle more or fewer leads, but this is just to get you thinking about how this funnel works. Okay, so with that information, we can just calculate the size of the sales team. So let's say round up because again, one sales agent can have max 25 leads, so we need to round up. We always need to be hiring ahead of the number of leads. So 50 leads divided by 25 per person, round that to zero. So we have two people on our sales team to start out with. And we'll extend these numbers out in a second, but I'm just kind of building the basic um, information right now. So then let's say we have conversion rate lead to sale. So how many of these leads, these 50 leads, do we think we're really gonna convert? And I'm gonna put an assumption of 3% in. So that's what we'll use for our model. And we say, okay, 3% of people will be converting. And I'll just show a decimal just so you can see, be more exact. And then finally, let's say new sales. So these are contracts signed, okay? and then duration of contract. So this is months, 
So, um, and then annual cost and new bookings. So let's talk about this. So let's say the enterprise software that we built is, and I'm just making this up, but like a carbon output tracking software. A lot of companies are trying to go carbon neutral. A lot of governments are trying to figure out how to do more carbon capture. And let's say we came up with some product that tracks the carbon for companies so that they can go um, like net, net zero carbon, something like that. And it costs $20,000 a year. So first things first, um, let's say it's $20,000. So our sort of uh, duration of the average contract is 12 months. And this is standard with enterprise software. They generally, they won't let you pay month to month. If anything, they sometimes force you to pay two or even three years. Um, and then let's say the annual cost, and I'm just stealing the format, is, is $20,000. So one client must pay $20,000. And then again, let's do a round formula, round. We're gonna take these leads and we're gonna multiply them by the conversion rate, lead to sale. Round it to zero. So that's two new contracts per month and so our new bookings are gonna be these two contracts times $20,000, right? So that's 40,000. And with these, they enterprise software businesses tr try to not let their customers pay on a monthly basis. They try to get all that cash upfront. They say, okay, you want this for 12 months, pay the full 12 months today. And the advantage to the business is that it capitalizes their business more so they don't have to raise as much money. And so they're always trying to pull the cash in early before delivering the service. And it's a big advantage of these long-term contracts is that you generate a lot of what's called negative networking capital, which is very, very advantageous because again, you don't have to sell equity in your company to keep growing. Okay, so let's move to the next section now. So now we have this basic kind of stuff figured out. And let's talk about uh, churn and expansion revenue. So if you haven't heard of these terms, um, these are the core concepts of enterprise software businesses and businesses on long-term contracts. So churn are basically people who've canceled the contract. So after their 12 months, they say, okay, I'm over it. I didn't get value out of it. I'm canceling it. So let's start with, um, so we have our recurring contracts, churned, um, annual churn rate, and renewal recurring. So you'll see where I'm going with this here in, in one second. And then you have expansion revenue. Expansion revenue. So churn rate is people that cancel. Um, expansion are people that we are able to upsell or cross sell. So let's say they buy our basic version of our product for 20,000 a year, but we're like, hey, you know, do you also want to track all your vehicles and your fleet for the carbon output of them? Or do you want to use this other you know, module that we just built? And if we can sell them additional products, that's called expansion revenue because we're expanding the amount that our existing customers are spending. And so the, the relationship between churn and expansion is that if you have constantly customers canceling, you have to get new customers all the time to keep growing. But if you can hold on to your existing customers and upsell and cross-sell them more things, then that revenue is very sticky. You're going to have it sort of repeating for many, many years. And that's a positive thing. So repeat of expansion. Let's say expansion, added, and then total recurring booking. So, so revenue that you lose plus revenue that you gain, and you'll have your total recurring bookings. So... Okay, before we build this whole section out, let's just extend um, extend our assumptions here so we can really see, you know, what do we need to do? So let's just control C, control V, but now let's start building this out and show it ramping. So I'm trying to get us to like around 5 million in new bookings each month because enterprise software businesses right now are valued close to 20 times annual revenue in terms of valuations. So if we can get to 50 million in annual revenue, that's sort of around the $1 billion valuation mark. So that's where we're trying to go with this model. So let's say we start scaling. 
Um, and then we want to start spending more in marketing because that gets us more leads, which gets us more bookings. And let's say we're going in and then, you know, we scale up even more. We're like, okay, we're going to spend 150 K for the next, um, you know, six months. So month, so through 24 and we're going to calculate on, uh, on the next tab, like all the fundraising we need to do to support this growth. But for now, um, we're just trying to back into how much growth do we need? Okay. Let's say 350 K for the next six months. And then, okay. So in month 31, let's really ramp it up. Let's say now $750,000 a month. And again, you can see that it gets us a lot of leads. It requires a much, much larger sales team. And then in month 37, let's say, okay, $1.5 million. Now we're really getting it going. And let's do that through month 42. And then finally, for the very end, let's say $2.5 million a month. And you can see I'm watching the new bookings down here. I'm just trying to get it high enough so that we get near that. 5 million mark. Okay. Okay, so we're not quite at the 5 million mark, but let's look at our assumptions here. So let's say that, okay, it's $500 a lead when we start. Nobody knows who we are. We're just like sending them those annoying messages on LinkedIn, and it's tough to kind of get those first few sales. But let's say after a little while, our brand starts to get known. So maybe for the first 12 months, we're we're kind of chipping away one customer at a time. But then some of our existing customers start to recommend our product. And so we start getting leads that are cheaper or someone sees us on the news or something like this. And so our cost per lead goes from 500 to 400. And then let's say in the third year, it starts going even lower. It goes from 400 to 300. Well, that'll dramatically increase our number of leads. And there you go, 5 million new bookings a month. So this is what we need to be able to pull off. So let's figure out now um, how we're gonna do that. So now let's dive into this sort of recurring and churn and all this different stuff. So let's say our annual churn rate is 20%. And this is the percent of customers that after a year of being our customer, they, they cancel the, the service. So churn rate, annual churn rate of 20%. So this will get us so remember, these people that sign in uh, month 13, they don't come up for renewal until month 25. So we probably won't have any churn until month 25. So let's say negative round, and we just take the number of new contracts then, and we multiply it by our churn rate. Round it to zero, there we go. So again, when you only have two customers, the, the churn rate, you know, there's there aren't enough people to actually churn. But if I multiply this forward, you'll see that, um, you know, you start to have customers here and there churning off 20% after 12 months. So that makes sense. And so for our recurring contracts, people that are rolling from year one to year two, we take the two original people and we add that to... Um, you know, the negative number of how many people churned. So in this case, um, there's nothing to see. It's the same two people kind of continued. But uh, in these other cases, you'll see that, for instance, here, you had the 56 people that signed on in month 34, but 11 of them churned, and now you're stuck with only uh, 45. And these are, you know, people rolling forward. Okay. So let's look at this. And then finally, let's just look at the renewal recurring revenue. So this is the revenue that is going from year one to year two. So this is um, two contracts times 20,000. So this is like your recurring, your recurring revenue. That's just sort of rolling forward. And this shows how sticky revenue is because if you sign a client in year one, you know that revenue just keeps rolling forward and recurring and recurring for many years as long as they don't churn. Now let's look at expansion revenue. So let's say expansion, so for the customers that do roll forward, let's say they absolutely loved our product and 
they do want to buy additional add-ons um, and are willing to, to pay for more things because they, they had a really great experience. So let's say we're able to increase the order value by um, 12,000, the average customer that rolls to year two. So these people rolling forward end up rolling forward with 52,000 of recurring bookings because they are purchasing a larger package of products now. So this is our expansion revenue. So you have your um, contraction revenue and your expansion revenue. So now our recurring bookings are $52,000 a month. So let's go down to the next section. So how do you actually get these salespeople to do these sales? Well, what you need to do is you need to incentivize them and you need to create bonus plans that are exactly in line with the objectives of the business. So you basically just need to pay them a percentage of sales um, based on all of the selling that they're doing. And so there's kind of three main areas that they're doing, just to summarize. Um, you have, of course, you have your new, you have your new, new revenue, or your, let's say new bookings, um, renewals, because you want people to renew, it's really important. And then you have your expansion revenue. So this is um, cross sells, upsells, total. Okay, so this is what you're gonna pay in bonuses to your sales team. Um, and let's look at the actual percentages. So this is like your percent. So I did some research online and I think a lot of companies do it differently. But in general, I was seeing that um, enterprise sales reps can make um, like around 10% of the revenue that they book. So if they sign a new client, they take 10% of that as a bonus. Renewals are lower, it's like 2.5% ish. And expansion revenue, I was seeing like around 8%, but again, I think that varies a lot. And if someone's running their own company, they get to decide you know, what's the most important objective of their company and how are they going to incentivize their sales team to, to help them reach those goals. So, okay, so now let's look at this. You have your new bookings and you multiply that by 10%. So that's what you're going to pay your sales team in bonuses. And then you have your, where is it? Your recurring bookings and you'll pay people 2.5%. And the reason why that's lower is because it's probably a lot easier to do. And then finally, you have your expansion revenue times 8% because, you know, if you can expand the revenue, um, it's really, really good for the company and it's going to help the company have a higher valuation. Okay, so $4,000 is getting paid out to your sales team. If we just copy control C, control V, um, you know, as we scale the business up, we're going to be paying out large commissions as the sales team is able to scale up our sales. Okay, so let's take a quick breather. First off, thanks for following along. If you find this content valuable, please subscribe to my channel right now, like this video, let me know in the comments if you have any questions or any reactions. By the way, you can download this model completely for free in the description. My goal with this channel is just to open source and democratize all this information for everyone, for students, for founders, for, for, for anyone that needs it in the world. So download this model, adapt it, use it for yourself, have fun, and uh, thanks for supporting my channel. Okay, next section. So now that we've got sort of the basic sales funnel set up, we have to actually look at, okay, what do our bookings look like? What are our total active customers at any given time? We haven't actually looked at that. Um, and then finally, how does our revenue recognition work? Because we're we're booking like $20,000 for a 12 month contract, but then we have to recognize the revenue over those 12 months. So the cash versus revenue dynamics are gonna be crazy and that's why we're gonna need to build uh, a revenue recognition sort of formula and model out the balance sheet and the cash flow statement so that we can understand what really is happening with our cash. So let's start with this revenue active customer section. So let's say new clients, existing okay let's just get rid of these formats bold underline save new clients existing clients and churned clients and then you have your total clients total clients okay 
so your new clients you're going to have, of course, here, new. Existing, there's none here. Turned, there's none. We're in month 13. Okay, so let's, but let's look in month two. Existing clients, you use the two clients from the previous month. Those are now existing clients, but you sign new, two new clients, so now you have total clients of four, which again, makes sense. Um, so let's hit control C and jump forward to the part where the clients start to churn. So um, first let's link this in churned and let's go find the row for churned clients. It's here, row 41. So as we extend that forward, you'll see that those churned clients get subtracted out of your total active clients. So extending that forward, you'll see that down the line, you have here, you sign 250 new clients, you have 1661 clients from the previous month, and you churn 11 clients. So your new total is 1900. So by the end of this, you have almost 3000 sort of active clients at any given time. So next, let's think about bookings. So with bookings, there's basically two main categories new bookings and recurring bookings. So let's look at uh, new bookings. And again, we already have this information below, but it's just good to pull everything up into summaries because then it's, it's easy to understand what's going on um, when you have an, a quick summary like this. So we have new bookings. Let's just pull that forward. Then you have um, a couple types of recurring bookings. And again, I'm gonna break them out so that any sort of investor looking at our models would immediately see what, um, what our plans are for renewals, expansion revenue, and total recurring. And then down below, we're gonna to do total, total bookings. Okay, so here we'll have our renewals and here, and let's just drag this over so we can actually see. So renewal bookings go down. We have um, renewals right here. In fact, we're one we're one month off here. So let's let's go grab that. So we have our renewal bookings here, and then we have our expansion bookings here, twelve thousand. Um, and finally, that totals to 52,000. So these are recurring bookings. So we can just take this formula here and just copy it all the way across. Again, I'm holding shift, down arrow, and then I'm still holding shift and just tapping the right arrow. That allows you to highlight sections, and then control V. As you probably noticed, I'm not using the mouse hardly at all. I'm learning how to use Excel, just using purely the keyboard and keyboard shortcuts makes you much, much faster. I actually have a course that teaches how to do, basically how to become a master at mouse-free Excel. Take a look at it, it's in the description below. Uh, it's really valuable, it only takes a couple hours to really learn all this stuff and it'll make you um, much more successful in your Excel-heavy job. Okay, now total bookings, 40 plus the recurring, and that will give you your total bookings. Okay, so now we have it nicely summarized. So when we go to this tab, we can see, okay, our total bookings are you know, 6.1 uh, million per month. Finally, revenue. So I, I bet you're wondering, okay, how exactly are we supposed to calculate this revenue? Uh, do we need to build some sort of huge uh, recognition schedule? The answer is no. There's always a shortcut, and so I'm gonna show you how. Average contract length. So let's just link this in. Of course, when you're doing revenue recognition, you need to know um, on what timeline you're recognizing the revenue, and that's 12 months. Now let's say revenue. So this is called monthly recurring revenue, and this is known as MRR. You'll see MRR a lot, MRR. Remember that acronym, it means monthly recurring revenue. It's sort of your SAS revenue metric. 
And then let's just say annual recurring revenue, and that's called ARR. Just throwing this in for fun. Um, you just annualize your, your MRR. So, okay, so let's take a look. How do we do this? So, I'm just gonna bring you along so that this is easy for you. So we have our average contact contract length of, of 12 months. And so, for instance, we know that, let's say in month 24, we have one twelfth of the, of the total bookings from month 24 we're recognizing this month, right? This number divided by 12. We also have this number divided by 12. And if you think about it, we have one twelfth of all the bookings for the previous one full year. So the shortcut here is just to say sum, take all the bookings from the previous 12 months and divide it by 12. This will give you the same exact number as if you took this and you divided it by 12 and you did that for 12 months. Look, this number, um, where is this here? This number here, you can see, is 125,000. So I just automated it with a really simple formula. You don't have to build this huge deferral recognition model. Um, always good to look for a shortcut. So that makes sense. So if I multiply that across, you can see our recurring revenue is obviously lower than the bookings because we're growing. So that's good news, but what about these first 12 months? This is a little crazier, but let's think through it logically. Okay, let's say sum, and this is another trick. Take your bookings from your first month and do a colon and then grab them again. What you wanna do here is lock the first N1 with a just tap F4, lock the column in the row, and then you're gonna divide this by 12. So what this does is, all it does is take 40,000 divided by 12. But if you copy this to the next cell, because this first cell is locked and the second cell is unlocked, you end up grabbing both cells and dividing by 12. And so this is how you can start from zero and calculate the ramp. Um, you just keep this one cell locked in the formula and then once you get to month 13, you just unlock that cell, and you'll see here, unlocked, so that when you move it to the right, um, the, the formula keeps referencing uh, bookings that move one month to the right each time. So again, if this is confusing for you, just download the file, take a look at this on your own time. This is correct, and just try to you know, study it and understand it. Okay, and then annual recurring revenue. You just take your monthly and you, and you multiply it by 12. And this tells you, okay, if you did this month the rate of revenue that you have in this month for a year, your revenue would be, you know, this annual recurring revenue number. So you'll see that as we get to month 48, we're at 58 million in annual recurring revenue. If we multiply that by 20, which is what the valuations are of a lot of these companies right now, especially the best ones, more than $1 billion, $1.16 billion. So we got our plan, we built our revenue model, now let's move on to try to understand, okay, what do we need to do in the first 12 months? How much money do we need to raise? What kind of team do we need to hire? How many engineers? What about our CapEx? What about our balance sheet? What about our cash flow statement? And so let's jump into that right now. I'm gonna just unhide these first columns because now we're diving into month one through 12. Okay, so here we are. We're gonna build our income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement. So this is gonna be exciting. So first we need to figure out what are we doing in these first 12 months. So I'm gonna just link in a couple things to start. I just wanna start with our active customers because I know we're gonna to need to reference this for some formulas. So, and it's good to always put stuff like this at the top of your models so that investors can see um, you know, some of the high level KPIs of, okay, where are we at today? 
you know, the revenue is XYZ, how many customers do we have? So I'm just gonna link this in at the top and then let's get rolling. So to do this, we're gonna need to look down below in our assumption section and there's gonna be a couple things. First off, right now we're gonna build out the team we need for that first 12 months to really build this platform and then we're gonna add in the capex and the assets that we need to purchase. So first things first, let's start with Amazon Web Services. I threw in some, some basic numbers, but this is the cloud infrastructure products, like your infrastructure you need to build um, to buy through Amazon through, through the cloud. And so let's say we start with, you know, whatever, 5,000 a month, but maybe it's really 10,000 a month. And later on, it's, it's more. It's, you know, we start with 10,000 and then it goes to let's say 20,000 they have like this big suite of applications that you can buy you know all this different stuff that you need to support your business and then let's say 30,000 yeah maybe that's good okay cool okay and now let's talk about headcount so there's two kind of main things that you're going to have you're going to have um, a bunch of customer support reps, and then you're also going to have like your whole OPEX team. And so I'm going to show you kind of a trick right now on how to do this in a really simple way. So let's say head count. Um, so accounts per support rep, customer support, and then your benefits. Yeah, same thing from down below. You can just steal this. And then down in your operating expenses, customer support is in cost of sales because it's a direct cost of the product, but everyone else would be down in your operating expenses. So let's say you have your sales team and we actually already know how many people are on our sales team. We already calculated that. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> then we have our marketing, creative, technology, product management, exec slash admin. Okay, so let's say we, we group all of our employees in one way or another into these categories. All right. And let's say we start here um, with, again, let's put this all in blue. Um, Hard-coded assumptions always in blue, formulas always in black. That's how we do it in finance and business in general. So you want to make sure you follow that rule. Um, so salespeople, none. There's nothing to sell. Marketing, nothing to market. Creative, nothing to create. Well, a lot to create, but you don't need any designers or anything probably. It's probably just going to be a bunch of engineers, a bunch of product managers, and some maybe you have like a founder. Okay. And again, I'm completely making these numbers up, but just to show you sort of, you know, what it could look like and how you build these models structurally and, and ramp them up to try to understand, you know, what do we need to do? Okay. So let's say this is our team at the end of 12 months. And then we know in month 13, um, sales comes in. So we start hiring our sales team. And so where is that sales team? Okay, sales team, two people. So we know that is two people. Next, let's say, okay, now we've got something to sell. We hire five marketers, four creative people, and we keep growing our other teams. So now let's say we, we hire some more engineers, um, then we have some more product managers, we hire another executive, and so we're, we're building out our team. We wanna be a billion dollar company. We're probably gonna need a pretty large team. So let's say this team gets us going until month you know, 24. And in month 25, which is the start of um, our third year, or our second year of sales, Again, we keep our sales team, and this looks kind of crazy, like I'm ramping everything up once a year. Realistically, it would be like you'd be hiring people every month. But again, I'm just, I'm just putting the plumbing in so you can sort of see how this thing works. Um, let's say here we ramp our team up to um, 10, 10 marketers, and then eight creative people, 30 engineers, um, 12 product managers, four you know, of everyone else. And that takes us through, let's say, month 
36. And so by, by the time we get to month 36, I mean, this team is getting pretty significant. Um, and so let's figure out what the, the kind of final team we have to get us through to month 48 is. So a lot of salespeople, let's say now we're really going for it. We got, you know, 20 marketers, we've got 12 creative people, 50 engineers and IT people, 20 product managers, and then five of, of everyone else. And that takes us through month 48. So in month 48, our team is in the OPEX is like almost 500 people. And that actually sounds reasonable to me. Okay, so let's look um, at some other sections now. So we're, we're kind of focused on that first 12 month ramp, but you know, we can just fill everything in. So let's put in some of these other categories, other marketing, technology, um, missed fi uh, miscellaneous fixed expenses. I, I like to do a fixed expenses and variable expenses. Um, variable expenses as a percentage of bookings because it kind of gives you two categories to play with. Um, and let's say here, you know, technology is just like $10,000 a month. And then miscellaneous other expenses, 20,000 a month. So this is just, you know, whatever else you got hitting in this bucket. So through the first 12 months, let's say it's that. And then afterwards, let's say, um, you know, same, but now you have some other random marketing expenses and um, variable expenses as percentage of bookings. Let's start with 5% and we're gonna model this up above 5% and we can just kind of copy that forward. And then we can probably bump that down. 5% is kind of kind of look crazy once our bookings get really high. So maybe in, you know, month, 25, like one year in, we can we can bump that down to, to 3%. Okay, so now we're almost ready to build the PL up above, but we just the last thing is how many customer support reps do we need? And this is very similar to sales. It's just a function of okay, how what's the volume? How many accounts do you have? So uh, we know this kicks in here in month 13. So let's say one rep can handle accounts per support rep, can handle like 20, 20 accounts um, for our company. So in this case, we would round up, same with sales, um, take the accounts that each support rep can handle. So we take that ratio, um, but let's take the total accounts from up above and then divide it by accounts per support rep round to zero digits, Let's say divide. Okay, so we need one support rep and then 25% here. This represents the additional costs in the excess of the salary, like benefits, taxes, etc. If you have an employee and you pay them $100,000, you end up having to pay about 25% more than that when you take into account the taxes and the healthcare and all this other different stuff. So. It's, you can just use that assumption. So now we can see, if we just copy this formula forward, how many support reps we're probably gonna need by month 48, and it's 140. Okay. So yeah, I think that's it. So let's get started. Let's kind of put the PL together now. So if we roll up to the top, you can see we've got our active customers. And let's give ourselves a little bit of space here in the sort of revenue section. So first let's pull in net bookings. And this is easy. We can just pull this in again. It doesn't start until month 13, but our bookings, um, we can just pull in here from the top, total bookings, 40,000. Then let's say net revenue, MRR, remember that. Okay, so here we are with our MRR. Again, we can just pull that straight in. It is, you know, starts at 3000. So that's good to see. Then 
let's look at our deferred revenue. So now we're thinking about the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So the deferred revenue is going to be, I'm just going to put a negative sign because that's going to help us kind of visualize it better. 40,000 minus three. So what does this mean? It means we collected 40,000 in cash and we only provided 3,300 of the revenue that we owe to our customers. So we still owe them 36,000 in revenue. And so that's why it's deferred revenue. And this is going to go on our balance sheet as a liability, but we do collect the cash. So you will understand this shortly if you don't understand it already. Um, and I'm just putting in a couple other metrics that we'll definitely want to look at. Um, LTV to CAC ratio, we will calculate this at the end of building this model. This is the relationship of your the total revenue you expect to generate from one customer divided by the marketing costs that it takes to get one new customer. So it tells you how profitable are you on your relationship with one customer. Um, again, we need to kind of put the whole model together before we calculate this, but the annual run rate, we already got this. It's right here. Um, ARR. So it starts as, you know, 40, 40,000, but by the end of the model, it is much, much higher. 58 million. So again, we're in this sort of billion dollar valuation territory. So that's where we want to be. Okay. So now that we've got our basic stuff, let's copy these formulas over so that we can continue and move into our gross margin section, cost of sales and gross margin. Okay. So the cost of goods sold. So we know we've got our um, Amazon Web Services, AWS. Um, and by the way, pretty much basically all businesses are built on AWS now. So um, it's another good thing to remember. If you've never heard of AWS, uh, go and, and read about it. It's a massive, massive company and it's part of Amazon. So now let's look at, okay, here's my lazy man um, payroll forecast. And we're going to use this here and we're going to use this down in the operating expenses. So we just put the salary here. And let's put the salary in of a customer support rep. And let's say it's $50,000. $50, so customer support. And now we can just take our benefits, taxes, etc. And just copy it. And then total. Check this out. I'm going to insert a row. Shift, space bar. Highlight the row. Alt brings up all the, the menu without using the mouse. H is home. And then I is insert. And then R is row. So that seemed kind of slow, right? But here, I'll do it the way that I normally do it. It's fast. So again, um, a good thing to learn if um, you don't already feel comfortable with the keyboard shortcuts in Excel, I highly recommend that you, you start working on it. Okay. So here we are. So we've got our customer support and let's link that in. So we've got our salary and again, divide that by 12 because that's an annual salary, but we're looking at monthly and then multiply that by the number of reps. So we've got one rep and here you just take that monthly salary and you multiply it by the 25%. So look, the formula is like totally automated here. And now you just add those two things up and that's how much it costs your customer support team. So you can just multiply this across all the way to month 48. And um, okay, what's going on here? It looks like we are missing something. Oh, look, I had a formula error. I need to lock the salary. So hit F4 here. Now, you see that um, while it tracks down below the number of reps, it will lock the salary. Okay, here we go. So you see there's our customer support team. And then finally, let's look at our gross margin. So we forgot to link in AWS. So link in AWS. And again, drag that across. 
and it's starting to come together. Okay, so the gross margin of our business is the revenue, net revenue, minus, let's just do a sum formula, add up the 10,000 plus the support reps, and it's negative 10,000. It's also good to put a gross margin percent formula in here um, because gross margin is such a focus of startups. A lot of times your goal is to turn gross margin positive even if you're turning a loss because then you can see that if you scale your product up enough, that's how you become break even. So the gross margin is a constant focus. Enterprise software businesses, because they have so few costs and the cost of goods sold, generally have gross margins around 80 to 90%, 85% is pretty common. So that's kind of what you're targeting. So if you take, let's do an if error formula. This formula just makes it so that if you do the calculation and you get an error, you can show um, something different. So I'm gonna say 10,000 minus our revenue. I know that's gonna give me an error. Um, sorry, divided by our revenue. I know that's gonna give me an error. So now I do a comma, and if you took, put two quotation marks, it'll just show nothing in the cell. So it shows nothing. So let me just show you kind of what this looks like. You can see that, and again, this percentage should be percentage number format. Okay, so we start it, and obviously the revenue is low, but then you see the revenue starts scaling up, our gross margin starts scaling up, and then we get to above 80%. So, you know, good, solid enterprise software company. Okay, so let's just take a breather for one second and think about what we've done. We put together the entire customer acquisition plan. We looked at our marketing spend. We said, okay, how many leads are we going to get? How many sales reps do we need? How many sales can each rep do? Okay, of our existing customers, how many of them cancel? How many of them want to increase the amount they're buying? We put all these together, and then we figured out how to recognize the revenue. And finally, we're working on how do we build these first 12 months of, of the business? We're putting together our engineering team, and we're about to jump into the CapEx and all of the investments we need to make. And once we have that information together, we can look at how much money do we need to raise to finance the growth of this company. And it's going to be a lot of money, and that part is where we're going to have to look at the cash flow and the balance sheet. Again, if you are enjoying this content and finding it valuable, Download this spreadsheet for yourself. Use it for whatever you want. It's totally free. And please subscribe to my channel, like this video, and check out some of my other videos. I've got a lot of videos on startup financial modeling, balance sheet modeling, customer lifetime value, all kinds of different stuff for technology and startup businesses, and I think you'll find it really valuable. Okay, so let's jump in. So now, operating expenses. So see here what we did? you know, this, what I call the, uh, the, the lazy man payroll plan, we're going to do it again. So personnel expense, insert some rows, um, put this little salary thing here. And then we just basically need all of our, of our categories. So I'm going to copy the different types of roles that we have here. And then, okay, let's just say total personnel expense. But there's one thing that we cannot forget. Bonuses. These are the commissions from our sales team. So, you know, that's, that's going to be a big piece. Okay, so let's say our sales team makes like a 75,000 base, but um, with sales teams, like, a huge percentage of their compensation can come from bonuses. In fact, it can be, I mean, there's no ceiling on it. It can be a ton of money. So generally their base salaries are lower, but their bonuses are, are super big. And you know, the more they sell, the more they make. Let's say our marketing people make 90,000, creative people make 60,000, our engineers make 100K each, product managers make 80, 
and then let's say our execs slash you know whoever else make 125 again just completely making these numbers up so here's what we do again um, link in your salary and in this case we want to lock the column so I'm tapping F4 the column is the number so this is so we can copy it up and down and it it will still reference these these numbers but it'll go up and down so look if I copy this down the the column stays locked but the row moves okay so lock the column divided by 12 months and then multiply it by the number of people you have in that role which is right here there you go um, and then take the dollar signs away okay here you can see that you have the numbers bonuses let's link that in um, again remember we're on month one so there's going to be no bonuses yet but we still know that we calculated it okay here bonuses commissions and you might notice I'm putting dollar signs at the top and the bottom of each section um, it's just the best practice so you know you don't need to include dollar signs everywhere just put commas uh, in the middle sections so bonuses and then finally benefits we're just going to take um, benefits taxes etc we're just going to take the whole sort of compensation section and multiply it by 25 percent this will get us something that's you know pretty close and a good estimate so finally we sum up this whole section and there it is that's our that's our payroll for month one and now we can just copy this forward easy all the way through month 48 okay so by month 48 it's like 4.3 million a month in sort of um, compensation costs and I think that makes sense all right so now let's look at the total OPEX so we've got our sort of total other OPEX look at this total other OPEX and again we can just copy in sort of some of this stuff from below just some sort of simple formulas um, yeah it's just these four four categories so just link it in other marketing take the dollar signs off and just take take your bookings here at the top net bookings and multiply this by the percent so again this is like a variable expense um, and we don't have any bookings but when we drag this out to month 13 and we start having bookings it starts to calculate so let's put a bottom border we can just say total total other optics look filled it in for us sum this up 30,000 here we go almost finished our OPEX and let's just drag this across to month 48 and there we go 230,000 a month now let's look at our total OPEX our total total OPEX and this will be the personnel expense plus the total other OPEX. And this is 306K. Bring this out. So by the end, once we're a $1 billion company, um, you know, our OPEX is going to be 4 or $5 million a month. So if I zoom out a little bit, um, not too much, but our operating profit is going to be our gross margin minus our OPEX. So that, and we can just do sort of like a top and double bottom border just to call that out as a really important metric. That is going to be, let's see, um, negative through the end of the model. But again, think about the cash flow. We're collecting so much cash that we might actually be cash flow positive before our operating profit is positive. So that's what we're going to look at here. Um, operating profit is earnings before interest and taxes 
And so again, I want to do the same kind of if error and then divide this by the revenue, which is up above and, and then put the two quotation marks in. So kind of see what the margin is and you'll see it over the course of the model, you know, improving. So what you'll see is it's, you know, look, by the end of the model, the business is almost breaking even negative 9%, but it starts, you know, negative, you know, very negative and probably in year five, this company would be, would be breaking even on an operating profit standpoint. Okay, couple other things. Um, because we're actually not turning a profit, I, I don't think I'm gonna add this. Well, I can do it. I think it would, it would be interesting to see. But basically, all the profits that you accrue as this business, you can, sorry, the losses, they can be later used to offset um, taxes. So if I take these sort of negative, these tax losses, it actually becomes an asset that I can then put on my balance sheet. So check this out. So I have accrued like $37 million in losses by the end of 48 months. And later what I can do is if I turn a profit, um, what I can basically do is I don't have to pay taxes until you know all the prior losses have been offset by future profits. So until I've turned say 37,000, 37 million more in profits in the future, I won't have to pay taxes. So it's a way of reducing your taxes by sort of growing unprofitably. And just as a quick sort of interesting thing, I can put a formula in, in here. So if I say, if you know this tax loss asset, once it goes positive, I'm gonna start owing taxes back. But for now I have this sort of loss that I can carry as an asset. So once this number is greater than zero, well, then I'll probably have to take my operating profits and pay, let's say 21%, which is the current federal, federal tax in the United States. But if not, I'll just pay zero. So let's see here, times 21%. This is if, not if error. If my tax, my total cumulative um, profits or losses if it actually turns positive, I'm gonna to have to pay taxes. If not, I don't pay anything. So if this went positive, you'd see that it would sort of help you to understand that prior losses you can use to offset um, future gains from a tax standpoint. So here's your operating profit. You know, you're not paying any taxes on it. So your final net income is gonna be right here. So, you know, obviously it, costs a lot of money to build a billion dollar company. But how much money exactly does it cost? Well, let's look at one more piece here, which is your CapEx schedule, and try to figure out, um, you know, what's your depreciation and amortization? You know you're gonna have some DNA, and so we need to go figure out what that's gonna look like. Okay, so I've got something basic set up that we can kind of work with, and um, so let's say we were given some assumptions. So in month one, we're gonna to have to fork out $5 million, sorry, no, $500,000 for some new software. And in general, software is depreciated over 36 months. This is sort of a very common time that you depreciate software. And then let's say we need some more software, um, software, no, not number three, software number two in month four. And then let's say in month 13, when we launch the platform, we're gonna to need to invest $2 million more. And then maybe in month 25, you're starting to get into year three, you have $3.5 million more. And then finally, let's say there's some other tech that we need to invest in down the line, maybe like month 36 and another million dollars. And so the software, Let's say we depreciate that for 36 months and the other tech, let's say it's like 48 months. Let's say it's something else. So again, I'm just gonna do this in a really simple way. 500K, lock the cell, and then divide this by 36, lock the cell, and just drag that out for 36 months. 
So you can see it tells me right here, sort of on the screen, it says 36, copy paste. Okay, now just take your 250K and then divide it by 36. And then again, just drag that thing out for, for 36 months. Okay, fine. Let's just check it. Oh, I went one month too long. You can check it here. Just highlight the whole thing, you see 250K. Next, let's take your $2 million here, divide that by 36. Again, 36 months, drag it out. And let's see. And then finally, your, your last two purchases, we don't even have 36 months left. So you can just kind of drag it out through the end of the plan. So take this and pull this across. And finally a million dollars here. Divide that by 48 and that gets you your sort of depreciation waterfall. So here up top, you can now see your total CapEx schedule. This is the kind of cash in, cash out. We can feed this into the fixed assets on our balance sheet. And here's the depreciation, which we can feed straight into our, well, it hits every financial statement, but to start with our P&L. So let's link this in right away. So first off, P&L. Depreciation here, we're gonna start this off Month one, $13,000. So that's what we're gonna see here. And then just copy and paste that in, easy enough. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. So finally, to really understand what we need to do in terms of fundraising, we need to build, let's start with um, a cash flow statement. We need to figure out, you know, how much cash do we have? How much cash do we need to make it? So let's start. And again, these are like, this is like a mini cash flow statement and a mini balance sheet, but it's going to show everything that we need to show. So let's start with um, cash from operations. And this balance sheet will balance, you'll see. Um, always just put your net income at the top. That's really what you're doing in the cash from operations section. And then you're just making adjustments to it. So net income, you know, we're not going to model out accounts payable, accounts receivable, all this tiny stuff. This stuff doesn't matter. What we need to figure out is how much cash we have and how much cash we are collecting up front from making people prepay those packages. So that's the deferred revenue. It's really the only thing that actually matters. The other stuff is, it's too small, we don't care about it. It's not useful for what we're doing. So we're gonna have net deferred revenue. This is that cash that we're pulling in, but we haven't provided the service yet. Depreciation, again, easy. And this is gonna be our operating cash flow. So, net deferred revenue. Okay. So let's model out this deferred revenue on the balance sheet. And I like to model out sort of the balance sheet um, in tandem as I model the cash flow statement. Okay, so deferred revenue. So let's look, deferred revenue is pretty simple. So it's just a cumulative account of how much revenue um, we owe our customers. So up above, we have this deferred revenue. So our, we don't actually have our first revenue until month 13. And let's display this positively. Um, and then you'll have this. Your deferred revenue in the first month is 36,000. And then I put a minus sign so that we can keep showing. So what does this mean, right? Um, in the first month, you see your bookings are 40,000, but you only provide 3,000 of revenue because they, they paid you for 12 months and you only gave them one. So you still owe them 36,000 of services, right? 
But the benefit to us is that we are just sitting on all that cash. So it helps to finance. We pull up the liquidity in our business and we generate all of this cash that we get to use to finance ourselves. So this is fantastic. Um, businesses with lots of, of deferred revenue are amazing because they finance themselves with their customers' payments. So maybe we wouldn't have to um, do as much in terms of uh, fundraising and things like that. Okay, so this is going to be pretty easy. So what you do here with deferred revenue is you just take your total balance and you subtract the previous month. And in terms of a cash flow from operations standpoint, um, let's just pull this forward. You can see that this is just cash to us. So that's cash that comes in the business. And so you start with net income and you make this adjustment. Actually, we generated more cash than that. Okay, so that's great. And now the next thing we can do is we need to add back depreciation because again, that's a non-cash expense. Um, and we can just grab it out of the P&L or you can grab it on the depreciation tab, doesn't matter. And the, that's gonna be the total for the operating cash flow. Again, I'm not gonna be modeling accounts receivable, accounts payable, all this tiny stuff which normally you would model on the balance sheet because deferred revenue, depreciation, and then our CapEx is gonna be 99% of what actually affects our cash flow. So I'm trying to stick to like the minimum viable product to manage our cash and to run a startup. So please don't complain in the comments that I didn't model accounts payable with some very long spreadsheet. I know that I didn't, but I also know that it doesn't really matter. Okay, so here we go. So we can copy this across. Um, and yeah, we can just copy this forward. This shows our operating cash flow. And okay, so part one of our income of our income statement is done. Deferred revenue. There's there's no deferred revenue in the beginning, so we'll just delete that. So what's the next section of the cash flow statement? There's three main sections. You have your cash flow from operations, and then you have your cash from investing. Okay, and this is capex. Cash from investing is the section where we show any investments that we make, any assets that we buy, or other businesses that we invest in. And so again, this is pretty simple. We can just grab this straight from our CapEx. So we know 500,000 goes out the door in the first month. And then if we just copy this forward, it shows that you know as we buy assets over time, that cash goes out of the business. Okay, but let's think about how does this show up on the balance sheet? Well, deferred revenue is in the liability section because it's revenue that we owe to our customers, right? And, um, but now where do, our, uh, where do our CapEx purchases go? Well, those are fixed assets. So let's say fixed assets depreciation, and then you have your net fixed assets. And we have to build the balance sheet and the cash flow together um, in order to get the, the balance sheet to balance and to actually, the ultimate goal of this is to figure out how much cash we actually have. And the, the net income will not tell us that. So fixed assets are just your, you know, whatever you bought, in the first month, and then just add to that um, whatever you bought in the second month. And so it's just a cumulative account of how much you're buying. So now you see we bought something else, and we bought something else. So it shows us sort of what is the total original value of the assets, but then you have your depreciation. First off, the depreciation on the balance sheet is negative. So because it is a measure of how much the actual asset itself has lost value to try to get more of like a net value. Because if I paid $10 million for some cool software in 1983, well, probably in 2021, it's worth zero. So you need to depreciate your assets from an accounting standpoint to try to be somewhat accurate. So 
I'm going to take this, I'm going to subtract the next month's depreciation. So again, it's a cumulative balance that offsets the assets. So here, bottom border, and I just add them together, and then you see a net fixed asset value. So it's less than the total um, original cost of the assets, and let's see, after 48 months, it is... Okay, so yeah, we paid seven whatever million, but now it's less than two million. So that kind of makes sense intuitively. So we have our depreciation, boom, we got it on the balance sheet. Deferred revenue, boom, we got it on the balance sheet. CapEx, on the balance sheet. So we're good so far. So what's the next section of the cash flow statement? The third and final section is cash from financing. Oh, financing. Okay, first section, cash from operations. How much money, cash, do we have coming in and out of the business from providing our product or service? This is how much cash did we invest in projects, either assets or other businesses. And this is how much cash did other people invest in our business. So the only thing we're going to have here is new equity, but debt, equity, any kind of outside financing goes here. And this is going to be the line where we play with um, fundraising rounds and we actually try to figure out how much do we need in fundraising. So let's say that in the first month, like maybe we're some really well-known investor, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs and some um, VCs know us and they know we've done other things successfully and they say, we want to fund you the first $7.5 million will be your, you know, your pre-seed round or your seed round while you build this enterprise software platform. And by the way, I have another video that does sort of a deep dive explaining every part of the cash flow statement. I'll include a link to that below if you want to dive a little deeper and make sure that you understand sort of what the cash flow is. Okay, so now we have the net cash flow. So I'm going to put a bottom top and double bottom border just to make it look a little more fancy. So we take our operating cash flow, subtract CapEx, and add new equity. And that makes sense because it's sort of cash that, you know, this is cash that's coming in or out, this is definitely cash going out, and this is definitely cash coming in. So this tells us, um, you know, the actual cash in and out happening in the company. Okay, so now we can almost figure out what our real cash balance is, but we need to finish the balance sheet. So, there's one major section that we have not touched. So, we've got our sort of total liabilities here. Total liabilities, um, which is, well, it's just our deferred revenue, really. Um, and we have our... Um, we have our assets and cash. This is, you always have to do cash last on the balance sheet. That's what we use the cash flow statement for. So um, here we have our total liabilities. And we will have our total Assets, I'll just copy this. Control V, total assets. So this will be cash plus net fixed assets. Easy, um, but we're missing um, owner's equity, equity section. So assets equals liability plus equity. So here's our equity section. And there's two main things we're going to have in this. First is going to be um, new financing. So it's going to be like our, um, you know, equity investors. And so down here, this will be easy. We just say, okay, how much did people put in? Great. Take that month and just add any new equity that comes into the company. So new financing. And then you have your course, your retained earnings. And this is like a cumulative look at your um, net income above. So you take your net income, take the previous months, 
and just add it. Don't forget to put your retained earnings section in the balance sheet. If you don't, um, you will suffer the consequences of your balance sheet never balancing ever. So would highly recommend that. Um, total equity, and you'll see our balance sheet is about to balance, so um, I hope. Here we go. So total equity, here we go, is these two things added together. And again, let's just put a little accounting format. And then we can just copy this across. Okay. And then finally, we are going to have a balance check. Balance check. So remember I said assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity? Well, you just take assets and you subtract liabilities and you subtract owner's equity. And this number, when we balance the balance sheet, will be zero. So let's just pull that forwards and see if we can get this thing to balance. I haven't actually checked if this balances yet, but I'm pretty sure that we'll figure out how to balance it. So your cash, how much cash do you start with? Well, let's assume this is the only cash you had and then you burn through some of it. So your net cash flow is your cash at the end of month one, right? Here we go. And then what you do is you just take your previous month's cash and you add your net cash flow. Okay. Now we're balancing. So let's just pull this forwards. And this is what we've been trying to figure out with the whole balance sheet cash flow section is, okay, little quick round of applause. The balance sheet balances. If your balance sheet doesn't balance, um, you know, you just need to dive in and, and check every single section and, and make sure that everything makes sense. But it looks like it's balancing. So what do we do now? So now, we have our whole sales plan, we have our whole CapEx plan, we know everything we wanna do, but we still don't know how much money it's gonna cost. So we need to focus on cash and say, okay, we got the 7.5 million in the beginning, right? When do we start running out of cash? Because we're gonna to have to raise a bunch of fundraising rounds. So let's look at this cash and try to figure out when to raise and how much. So. Looks like we start running out of cash, getting pretty close, dangerously close in month 12. So we should probably be fundraising for the you know three to six months leading up to month 12 and close around in month 12. But how much? Well, let's look how negative our cash ends up going. And when you raise around, you usually wanna raise enough money for like 12 to 18 months. But you don't wanna to raise too much because you know 18 months from now, your valuation is going to be better. So you don't want to tell, sell too many shares at a lower valuation. So you want to raise just enough to get to a bigger valuation and then keep raising incrementally. So it looks like our cash is going to go pretty negative. Um, so we probably want to raise maybe, you know, 20 million in month 12 if we, you know, if we really want to make it and kind of hit the next valuation sort of milestone. So that's 200 million. Um, okay, so 20 million. So we'll have to sell some percent of our company, um, you know, depending on our valuation at this time, and that'll get us further ahead. So now we're cruising. We've got plenty of cash, but again, our net cash flow is still negative because we're growing the company big time. We're investing in assets, all this different stuff. And, uh-oh, yeah, our cash is looking, you know, dangerously low again. But by this time, you know, month 20, 28, we should raise. We're down to 10 million in cash again. But look at our revenue by now. It's getting to 300,000 MRR. Like, our valuation is probably 250 million, maybe 500 million. So we can raise a big round now without selling um, and diluting too much. So, you know, if we look here, do we expect to become profitable soon? No, we're still, we're still kind of burning money. Um, 
but you see there is some moment around here when our net cash flow actually starts to become positive. Why? Because of this incredible net deferred revenue sort of cash that we're collecting each month. So you see the business here actually starts to turn a profit, but that doesn't make sense to me. How could that be? There's got to be something missing here. Personnel. We forgot to feed in our advertising expense. Look at that. All right. Never too late to go back and fix your model. Okay, look at this. Other marketing is here. Ad spend. Look at this. I knew something looked weird. Watch this now. Okay, now let's see if this business can turn a profit. I would doubt it. Yeah, so look, that looks more right. So your business is working towards profitability still, but when you're growing 400% a year or whatever, it's, it's not gonna be profitable. It, you're growing too quickly. Okay, but our balance sheet still balances, so Okay, so let's go back here. So we raised the new equity, right? $20 million in month 12. That looks like it's going to get us, you know, maybe to month, I don't know, I'd want to raise it in here, you know, before you get too far below 10 million. So, and, you know, you're still burning significant, significant cash. So to get from month 28 to month 48, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be down 20 million. I would raise 40 million um, because you want to be able to burn that 30 million between to get to month 48 and still have some cash in the bank. So I would say 40 million. Yeah, that looks right. Um, and that would get us. Okay, then we'd have 20 million at the end. Again, you see earlier on that, you know, we're we're burning a ton of cash each month and we keep burning cash each month, but we know um, that our margins are improving and most of this cash that we're burning has to do with just onboarding new customers. Our existing customers are super, super profitable. So now that we have sort of a fundraising plan and let's look, how much fundraising did this actually require? Let's see here, 67.5 million. Most companies that try to get to a billion dollar valuation, not most, but many, will have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, 100, 200, 300 million dollars. So if we could do this, it means that our business model is really solid. Um, and I wanna walk you through a couple more of the sort of metrics that help investors and businesses look at these enterprise software businesses. So now you can see, you know, the scaling plan that gets us to that 1 billion valuation, how complicated it is to manage our cash. Um, you know, how do we figure out, um, you know, when to fundraise, how do we plan our balance sheet? How, you know, what does the relationship look like with existing customers? So I want to fill in a couple things for you so you can really see the underlying unit economics of uh, the relationship with one customer. So first off here, I have the, the annual run rate, of course, is important. But now one really important thing is the lifetime value, which is the total revenue you expect to generate with one customer, divided by the customer acquisition cost, which is the total marketing investments that you invest to get one new customer into your business. And we want to understand the ratio. You know, how much are we going to make versus how much do we spend? And that ratio is critical to knowing when you will become profitable or if you will become profitable. So let's let's dive into some of the key SaaS and KPI metrics for like enterprise software businesses so you can understand 
what uh, investors are primarily focusing on when they think about these businesses. So obviously you have your, your ARR, right? Your annual run rate. This is super important, just kind of from a valuation standpoint, you know, the best businesses may be valued at 20 times their ARR. Okay, next you have your annual churn rate. Let's talk a little bit about churn. So churn is the percent, and we have churn here. Churn is the percent of customers that cancel. And with a typical consumer business that's more month to month, like if you have, I don't know, Spotify or something, you can cancel that on a monthly basis. So your churn rate is typically monthly with a with a like a consumer business, but with these enterprise businesses, you can't cancel. You have to sign these 12 month contracts or sometimes 24 or 36 month. So you're looking at churn on an annual basis. So even if your churn is 20%, if you think about that on a monthly basis, you divide that by 12, it's only like 1.7%. It's super, super low. So what it means is that your customers are very sticky. In fact, if we just take one and do we, do we divide it by the churn rate, your typical customer will stick on for an average lifetime of five years. So that's why these businesses, the revenue is valued so highly because once you sign a customer, that customer just keeps paying you for, assuming you have a 20% annual churn rate, five years, and a lot of businesses have churn rates that are lower than this, enterprise businesses. So this is a really important to understand, you know, are you growing just because you're signing a lot of new clients or are you growing because your existing clients are sticking around and you're signing new clients? And so to get, um, you know, now let's look at the growth rate. So you want to understand that too. How much are your clients sticking around and how much uh, are you growing overall if you combine all the metrics? So we need to look at, so this is 12 months. So we need to look at one year out. What's our monthly recurring revenue? So we go to our P&L and we can say, okay, month 25, divide that by 12 months back, right? And that'll give you the annualized revenue growth rate. So year over year revenue growth. We are growing, well, uh, kind of a crazy number, 5,000%. But um, if we pull this out to month 48, this number stabilizes and we're still growing the revenue 400% a year. So this is obviously really positive. And when you think about, okay, if today we're doing 60 million ARR, but we're forexing the revenue. Imagine a year from now what the revenue is going to be, you know, 250 million. Imagine five years from now, how many billions is it going to be? So this is what you need to keep an eye on. You need to look at churn. And I would say actually one of the most important metrics that I'm starting to see, and I see this a lot of times listed first from like venture capital, Silicon Valley kind of investors, is something called NDR, net dollar retention. I'll see NDR and I'll see annual um, annual revenue growth rate. Just these two things. So what is NDR? NDR is a study of just existing customers. So you completely exclude new customers that you're booking. And what you look at is how much are they paying, like on a recurring basis, your existing customers each month? How many of them are canceling? So you take that recurring revenue and you subtract churned revenue and how many of them are upgrading and buying more things? And that tells you, for your existing customers, are is that recurring revenue stream growing or shrinking? So do, are you? if it's shrinking, you're always going to have to get new customers to keep growing. But if your existing customer base is actually expanding in terms of its revenue, then you're growing from the standpoint of signing new contracts and by just maintaining a relationship with your other with your other customers. So this is really critical to know. So let me show you how to calculate it. So we start in month 25 because this is really when our recurring clients first have the opportunity to recur. So we are gonna look at revenue in this. So we're gonna take our bookings and we're gonna divide them by 12. So starting MRR. 
So we, let's look at our original bookings in month 13. And div oh yeah, new bookings and divide it by 12. So this is basically like um, the monthly recurring revenue that recurs, you know, after the people have a chance to re-sign up. Okay, so of those people, how many of those people churn and just say goodbye? I'm over it. Let's calculate that. So here we want to go to the churn section and take the number of customers who churned, which in this case it's zero, but in other months we'll have some numbers, multiply it by 20, um, and then divide it by 12 to get it to the monthly revenue. So in this case it's, it's zero, but let's expand that out a few months so you can see, okay, we have 8,000 of recurring revenue, but we actually lost 1,700. But what about people who expanded the amount that they're paying? So same, same idea. We take this expansion revenue and we divide it by 12 to get the monthly um, amount of revenue that we basically added to our recurring revenue stream. So in this case, check this out. So we, we had 3,000 recur, right? 3,300 recur. Nobody canceled. In fact, those clients added $1,000 of extra revenue onto their current packages. So now our uh, monthly recurring revenue is actually 4,300. It was 3,300, now it's 43. So our net dollar retention is, and it's a percent, 130%. So this shows us how much our existing customers are basically growing or shrinking. So if this number is less than 100%, it means that you're constantly losing existing customers. So the fact that it's over 100% is a great sign. Um, and the best SaaS companies actually have NDR of like 150% sometimes. So their customers are so happy with the product that they're constantly buying more. So that is a really important one. The next really important one is customer lifetime value. And this is pretty easy with, with the numbers that we have. All you have to do is you look at the annual cost of the product and you divide it by the churn rate, which is sort of a mathematical shortcut. And it's 100,000. We know one of these customers will probably stay on about five years. And so 20,000 times five years is 100,000 customer lifetime value. And so that's how much one new client is worth. So that's a ton of money. So we should be doing anything we can to get a new customer on. And with some businesses, like with Oracle, NetSuite, all the services they have, like the customer lifetime value is well over a million dollars. So for them, they will do anything to get a new customer um, into their company and they can spend a lot of money to do it. But now you wanna understand how much money are we spending to get new customers? So we are spending money on advertisements and then we're paying our sales team to close those leads. So that's how much we spend. So let's look at how much we spend to get those new customers. So first off, advertising. Okay, 25,000 we spent in month, um, actually that was month 13. 25,000 and okay, what about on sales commissions? So these are sales commissions for just new customers. Okay, 4,000, commissions, new bookings, 4,000. Now, the salaries of all those people on the sales team. That's of course, you know, a big cost. Okay, there it is, 12,500. And the total acquisition cost, this is all the money we paid to get our new customers was um, $41,500. But how many new customers did we get from that? Well, we have that number already as well. And it is, Two, we got two new customers. Well, was that a good use of our money? Well, let's look. 
the customer acquisition cost, 40000 divided by 2, each customer costs us $20,750 in marketing. It seems kind of crazy, right? Well, if each customer is worth $100,000 to us, then we actually are going to make 4.8 times what we spent. So we can do that all day. We can spend $20,000, $21,000 a customer every day of the week, and we should, because we're going to make five times that money back on those customers. So that is your LTV to CAC ratio. That is a hugely important metric, not just in software businesses, but in basically all businesses. Um, so I'm going to pull this into the P&L here, LTV to CAC ratio, just so that um, you know investors would be able to see that. In terms of 4.8 whatever as an LTV to CAC ratio, this will vary over time too, depending on our marketing inputs and stuff like that. But I mean, you you want it to be obviously um, probably at least two or three, but four, five, six means your company is really doing something right and your product is really sticky. And the best companies have, you know, five to 10 or sometimes even 20 times um, lifetime value to CAC. But um, if you can get to four, five, six, it's really solid, and a lot of these top enterprise software companies have an LTV to CAC ratio of like six. So this is pretty solid here. We want to display it. We want to show that off. Now you can see sort of some of these SaaS metrics that are really important. Investors are going to be super, super focused on, so it's good to just have this ready to rock um, before you go out and try to raise money. So this model you could honestly use to run an enterprise software business, you could use this model to raise money on for sure. Feel free to just download this for free in the description. Uh, my goal is just to open source this for startups and for and for students and for anyone who is interested in this kind of stuff and just make it free. I think it's going to help companies, help the startup ecosystem be more vibrant, help people learn about these new and very interesting types of business models and why they're so valuable. All right, so that's all I have for you today in this video. Now you should feel very confident building SaaS financial models and understanding enterprise software businesses, Silicon Valley startups, how they ramp up, how they scale, why these business models are so valuable. If you found this content valuable, please subscribe to my channel right now, like this video, leave me some comments and let me know what you think. Also, I included links to a bunch of other related videos in the description below, check those out if you want to keep learning. And if you want to improve your Excel and finance skills, check out some of my online courses. I included some links below. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.